Good morning. Welcome to an exciting webinar this morning, a uh, partnership webinar that um, myself, I'm from Sadar Group, uh, hosting together with RSM Partners. My name is Roger Hitchcock, as you can see on your, your screen. A massive, massive welcome to, to all of you. Um, I'm in Pretoria, presenting from Pretoria, South Africa, and I have together with me Ashif and Shaquille, who are presenting from, from Nairobi. So this is truly a multi-country, a multinational Africa-wide webinar, and we're very excited to be spending this time with you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for um, you know, investing. And really, this is the big question we want to ask is, is your board increasing your company's value? And so we're going to talk, and the reason I just give the background about where we're sitting is I'm going to be hosting the, the webinar this morning. I have a privilege of doing that, but there is going to be some, some jumping back and forward between South Africa and Nairobi. So please bear with us if there are some, some, some glitches and hiccups. Um, we are still all getting used to this new online world. But the wonderful thing is we can actually host something together in this way. So is your board increasing your company's value? We want to unpack a few concepts there. But before we do that, I'd like to you know provide an opportunity to just um, meet the fellow um, you know, participants, fellow panelists. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to Ashif. And Ashif, do you want to give a few words, a few introductions? Welcome. Wonderful to see your face again. Um, and tell us a little bit about RSM Partners. Thank you, Roger, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I want to first introduce uh, Shaquille, uh, who is my uh, co-panelist from RSM. Shaquille joined us recently. Shaquille has extensive experience having worked uh, as the head of transfer pricing for Barclays in the UK. And then he also has significant experience in risk and he's one of the few remaining accountants with uh, you know, varied uh, experiences around mm. you know, different fields, uh, which is very rare in this world. And he, he's joined us from July and brings up a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, expertise to us. Uh, RSM basically you know, is a global firm uh, in over 120 countries, we represent them in East, uh, East Africa, in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. Uh, and basically, uh, three things that define us uh, as a firm. One is uh, our values, you know, uh, uh, but the second is the commitment to our clients for quality. Uh, and, we are, uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, shown in the recognitions that we have won over a period of time as a firm. In East Africa, we have four offices. Uh, nine partners, directors, and about 180 staff. Uh, so that's basically, uh, you know, from a regional coverage. And in terms of services, we are an audit tax consulting firm. Uh, I specialize spe specifically in tax and helping, uh, you know, businesses through the consulting uh, uh, terrain, including uh, helping, you know, companies build value, uh, you know, and uh, family businesses, you know, develop a succession plan. Uh, as they are looking at exi uh, you know, exiting or you know, having a second level succession. So that's what I do for a living. Good. Thank you so much, Ashif. And I think um, great to know who's on the call because um, hopefully our attendees are starting to think of the questions they want to pick your brains with. Um, so prepare yourselves as we, as we go. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Sadar Group. Sadar Group, um, we're involved and focused primarily in what we call in the boardroom space. We deal at board level, directorship level, with a range of different, different types of companies. A lot focused on, as um, Ashifa said, one of our big areas of focus is private and family held businesses, doing a lot of work in that space as well. We are Africa wide in that we have offices in, um, in Cape Town, Joburg, South Africa, um, and then in Nairobi, um, uh, an, an office there, and then in Ghana. So, so a Southeast and West African footprint and it's a real privilege to to be able to you know work in these different areas in terms of the business itself there are we call it three legs of the business the first leg is a, a leg i'm very involved in the education side i think one of the challenges in today's world is as we see the world changing so expectations on business leaders are changing and so i do a lot of work educating directors and boards um, it's one of the reasons i'm on on on, on these kind of calls we also then help companies find and appoint independent directors. So a lot of the people that get trained through, through our, our programs have a view to becoming independent directors. And so we help match companies and directors. And then thirdly, 
there's a need for companies to be guided in terms of their board processes. And this does include the standard company secretarial legislative statutory requirements, but also understanding the dynamics in the boardroom. And I think that's critical. We've been in the space for over 10 years um, throughout Africa. Um, I've been had the privilege of training in boardrooms and working with boards for, for the last 11 or 12 years after a number of years in more general business um, practice. And I think that's led to a lot of the expertise that we have, especially most of our people in the business come with understanding of private business directorship, that, that kind of thing. So we really want to bring that to the table. And together with RSM, uh, I wasn't joking when I said, start thinking of your questions and your comments um, as we go through, as we go through this, this, this webinar. Just one of the reasons I look down is I'm, I'm presenting off two screens. The one is above the other. So that's what I'm you know, you know, presenting from. But what are we wanting to do today is unpack to some degree. We have an hour or so together. Um, but thinking through what does it mean when we think about and how does or how are we starting to see in the world the link between boardroom performance and company performance. Um, and so I'm going to provide a few you know, opening comments, remarks, thoughts around, around that. Um, we're then going to talk about valuation and realities. And that's where Ashif, I'm going to be handing over to Ashif at that point in time. And he's going to be taking you through some of the thoughts and ideas um, on that. And then alongside that, it's not just about growing value because company performance, and I think we've all been reminded during this pandemic, isn't just about growth, growth, growth. It's also about protection. And so one of the things, and I'm, I'm excited about, you know, um, Ashif's introduction of Shaquille because someone with risk experience is absolutely critical. And many of our boards, we may have that growth perspective, but do we have that protection perspective as well? And so he's going to take us through some of the risk management and thoughts around that as well. And then I'm going to close by talking through what we call board evaluation and composition. Because a big part of linking boardroom performance to company performance is making sure we have the right people in the team and in the room, and those people are dealing with the right things as we um, as we go. So very exciting to see a lot of the names that are that 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 are joining, and thank you so much for joining. Just a couple of you know rules of the game, rules of engagement as we go. Um, I use and I have in front of me. So another reason my head moves around while I'm presenting is because I'm continually looking at the chat box and the Q&A box that I have in front of me, along with the participants list. So I will be monitoring those as we go. And that's one of the reasons, you know, I, when I hand over, especially to Ashif and Shaquille to talk, I'll be monitoring some of that. Please feel free to engage with us. Please drop your thoughts, your comments into the chat box, or drop any specific questions into the Q&A function, which you'll find on your taskbar in Zoom. When you do ask questions, obviously there are three of us on the call and it'll be helpful if you can indicate who the question is for. And then what I will do is I'll manage those. We may not be able to deal with all of the questions um, where I see similar questions come up. I may combine them. Um, but please, as we go through the, through the call today, let's keep that engagement, that engagement high because it's absolutely critical that we don't just present what's on our minds, but we also understand what's on what's on your minds as, as well. If we start and think about you know, where we're going and where we're at at the moment, I think one of the challenges we're all facing is we're facing crisis or crises on multiple fronts. And that's putting massive pressure on the teams that we have, both at governance level in our companies, as well as at operational level. Um, we're seeing people having to do things differently than ever before in terms of regularity of meetings. But we're also seeing a challenge around how we view these companies of ours. And I love this quote, close scrutiny will show you that most crisis situations are opportunities to either advance or stay where you are. I would almost say that with that quote in mind, where the world is at the moment is probably not at a crossroads where there's an option to carry on. Actually, we're at a T-junction. And I think that's one of the challenges that, that, that I see in both this, this idea of company performance is how do we define it and how do we think about company performance when actually we have to make some massive decisions. And so it's thinking, do we have the right people around the room to do what is, to do what is necessary? Um, a, a picture that I normally have in my mind and um, I, I'm, I'm, I tend to see things in pictures and metaphors. And when we ask this question, how can a board leverage performance or what is the link between the boardroom and 
the company performance because ultimately that's what it's all about. Critical to understanding the role of the board is that the individual board member who serves together on a team with other board members that have been chosen and put together appropriately, applying, doing the right thing, we call that an applied boardroom methodology, must change or must move, must have an impact on company performance. If the company is a result of the individual directors and the board itself, the team of the board, applying the right thing, doing the right thing, if company performance doesn't move, now obviously the challenge is how do we define it in times like this? So effectiveness is being challenged. Is it just growth? Is it just, you know, preventing us from, you know, disappearing, surviving and thriving become the challenges around how do we define effective companies? But also in today's world, there's a massive need for accountability. Um, we've seen that over the last 10, 15 years with changes in legislation, updates and regulations. We've starting to see some of the court cases coming through the systems all over Africa and the world where directors are being held to account for their directing role because it is a role of liability and it's a role of responsibility and accountability. But then also the other theme that we're seeing in terms of company performance is sustainability. And this is, I think is really where the risk conversation is critical because it's not just about the now or even the short term, but it's about the long term. It's these companies that we are directing, that we are accountable for, that need to be effective, need to last. And that's one of the critical things. And that's why I'm excited as well about, as Shifa said, the family businesses where there are multi-generational viewpoints and how do we convert that into, um, into actual effectiveness in you know, what a board what a board does. Um, when we talk about it, well, I'll, I'll, I'll revisit this briefly, but when we talk about what the board does, so the concept of an applied boardroom methodology is essentially a cluster of themes that boards need to be properly, adequately addressing on an ongoing basis. And this links very strongly into both the value of the business, because the value of the business comes from doing all of these things appropriately, but also comes from protecting all of these things, from strategy to sustainability, effective you know, risk and stakeholder thinking in our, in our companies, effective financial um, controls and conformance performance of our people and our systems, all of those kind of things. And so I'll revisit this towards the end when we ask the question, who should be on the, who should be on the, on the board? Um, if we start and say, well, okay, let's start with thinking about this link between company performance and board performance. Um, Sadal run a survey um, annually. We've, we've, the second version of the survey has just been released. You could download it from our, from our website. But in the survey, it's mainly about directors' fees, but we do ask some critical questions, and I'm not going to touch on the fees part, but we ask some critical questions about company performance and composition of a board. And this is becoming really, really challenging and clear in the world today is that the, it's not just, so a board is, we always speak about the board as a unit, it's a team, but it's a team that consists of a range of different people. And I'll, I'll touch on some of those elements a bit later, but one of the things that ca came out of this last survey, um, the last SIDAR survey, was that boards with at least one independent director outperform boards without one. And this is probably one of the biggest challenges that many private companies have. It's bringing, in a sense, the outsider in. But if we recognize that, um, that, that, that we have to you know, think about the company and not just about who the shareholders or the directors are, but the directors understand that their necessity is acting in the best interest of the company, we start to review and revisit who should sit Around the, around the table. And what it looks like is this, boards with at least one independent director are outperforming, as I said, boards without one. Respondents were asked to self-evaluate. So we, in the survey, they, a number of key performance indicators linked to a high-performing board. Um, and a lot of those were either financial indicators, sustainability indicators, a, number, a cluster of things that really said there was this critical link between the board performance and company performance. The other thing, and one of the key indicators, and I know this has been stated in the negative, but one can think about it positively as well, is that boards without independent directors are less likely to report an increase in EBIDTA. And the key thing there is that 
if we think about the reverse, there are two key elements that are, we normally think about when we think about company performance. There's the value of the business and what does this thing that we are governing consist of and the value of it. But then there's also the capturing of the value, the, the, the payment out legitimately of shareholder returns at the end of the day. And so the profitability of our businesses is linked to, linked to both of those. And so one of the key things we've seen very, very clearly is that there is, the, there is this clear link between the structure of a board, what a board does, and valuation. And with that in mind, I want to hand over to Ashif, um, and he's going to take you through a few key thoughts and ideas in terms of what he calls valuation realities. Um, handing over to you, Ashif. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, so, you know, what I'll do is just from a uh, uh, transaction perspective, go through some of the issues around value. So traditionally, I think the value part is, you know, a lot of sellers say, this is the value of my company, but they forget that there is a willing buyer, willing seller. The value is not what you think, uh, what your company is worth, but it's really about what somebody else thinks uh, that what your company is worth. And the gloss on that valuation is brought about by three things. Everybody knows that there are cash flow methods of valuation and EBITDA methods of valuation and all those. But, you know, they are the basic prices, the things that give you in a multiple on EBITDA valuation between five and 15 or 20 is based on three or four critical areas, which I call the gloss. That's the gloss over the company that brings the real value. And the first is your purpose and vision. People really want to see what is this company doing? Is this company going to survive uh, in the next 20, 30 years? Uh, is, is there a dynamic culture within the organization? Is the top team working together? And all these aspects only come if you know, the board is functioning effectively and challenging the right questions. And also the purpose is not something it's, uh, that's only today. It's what do you see your company being uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road? What is your big area, the audacious goal that you're trying to reach? And what is that summit that you're planning to look into? And what is the vision? And sometimes in family business, it's a vision of the founders. But sometimes that vision has been narrowed over a period of time because it's like an onion that the, uh, the outside is just a gloss protecting the business but the inside realities have not been looked at. And, and to really look at the vision, one needs to peel that onion and get into the core of that business to understand what was the vision initially and is this vision being lived or because of the competition and you know, protecting the company, that vision has been covered by so many other layers. So that's a very critical part that any buyer sees. And when we are acting uh, from a buyer's side, these are the things that we would see in a transaction. The second thing is the management. And you know, today everybody talks about giving responsibilities and cascading responsibilities, but there is a, there is a critical issue that responsibilities come with accountability. If you're given responsibilities without somebody being accountable, then you have a problem. And in, in, a, in a good business, one person is accountable for one thing and not more, more than one thing. So if a managing director or the two or three founders are accountable for everything in the business, then that poses a real key risk on exit of that business. So how the management works, how the, uh, how the, you know, the plan works, is it top down? It is, you know, uh, so technically strategy comes from the top, but its implementation comes at the management level. And that link is very critical. Okay. And the, and the last part is, you know, when people are looking at earnouts. Uh, this is becoming very common that when you're selling a business, if you really have a very glossy picture, people don't want to pay you what is in today, but they want to pay you based on the future run out. And the problem is that if you have not thought through these issues, what will happen is that the glossy picture you're painting will not match with what, what was the past historical performance. And any historical performance and how the company has performed is a significant link to where it will perform in the future unless it significantly changes. So if you're looking at an earnout method, you need to have trusted your strategy for at least three, four, five years and make sure it's working, that the, there's clockwork in how the uh, you know, business works. And these gloss is very critical in determining the valuation. And it all comes from governance. And we'll see Roger take us through what the boards must do to bring this gloss to the valuation. 
Then there is the, ch the challenges in valuation, obviously from a, a buyer's point of view, comes from the quality of earnings. You know, are the quality of earnings solid? Okay, is this year on year? If there are blips because it's a seasonal business, how does this business perform over the seasonal cycles? Okay, and one of the critical challenges that always comes in, especially when you earn outs, is the issue, or even if you don't have earn outs, is the issue of warranties and indemnities. And I've seen some big challenges because we help resolve a lot of disputes. Uh, you know, we have been involved in disputes, uh, post sale transaction of up to $300 billion uh, in terms of valuation, where we have actually been the accounting experts at, uh, uh, you know, uh, arbitrations uh, in London. And the issue that comes there is the whole issue of warranties and indemnities. And that is where another a good board will have known their accounting policies. Because it's not just a matter of putting it in the financial statements. If you warrant your financial statements and they say that they comply with the accounting policies, and if that warranty is wrong, your entire financial statements could be proved wrong. So again, a good board needs somebody who understands that. And if it, there's nobody in the board, then you need to get that external expertise. Secondly, tax. Tax is becoming a critical aspect, okay? That are you compliant? Because that's one of the biggest disputes in any valuation that, you know, is there a compliance? Is there a risk? And even if, you know, you're indemnif indemnifying the uh, buyers against the tax uh, warranty, the bigger problem today is that what happens if you can't, you don't have enough money to pay them? So this is where a big risk comes. And in Kenya, I think uh, there's an advantage because there's an amnesty that's just been declared where, you know, people can do a cleanup, uh, you know, from next year. And the last part is disclosures. People don't spend enough time on disclosures because anything that you're warrant, you know, you're providing a warranty and indemnity as part of your uh, sell purchase agreement, you would indemnify that person. And, and, and then you have disclosures and the disclosures are things you're disclosing to a third party. How disclosures are worded is very critical. 15 years ago, I sold a bank and our disclosure letter, we spent 12 days drafting that disclosure letter sure. because there were too many problems. And at the end of the day, when the seller came back, uh, sorry, the buyer came back, mm -hmm. we said that all this was disclosed. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. how do you come back? Okay. We, and recently in these three areas where we have acted as the transaction advisor, especially we review also the legal agreements from a financial viewpoint to ensure that these areas are covered so the value is retained. But ultimate driver of all what I'm saying is good governance. If there is not good mm -hmm. governance, the quality of the numbers will not be there. And if the quality of the numbers will not be there uh, and the gloss around that quality uh, of the business is not there, then it impacts the value. And who is the, per yeah. who is the, who is the driver of that value? It really is the board. Mm, mm, great. I think what, what you've really illustrated there, Ashif, is that there is this definite link between the, the outside view, because the, at the end of the day, the, the rule applies that someone will only pay for what they believe is value. And often the internal view of value is, is, is quite out of line with what the external view of value is. And so it's alignment of those things which I think is absolutely critical. I think that's really, really important. Thanks for that. And I think if there are, as I said, if there are questions for a shift from that, you must drop them into the, into the Q&A box as we, as we go. But it's not just about this thing of growing value. And I think that's one of the, the key themes, as I said, that we've got to have a good perspective on our businesses. Um, I've seen business owners, shareholders who believe their business is worth a huge amount when they do the analysis and they get someone unfortunately like Ashif and Shaquille in to look at their businesses they say well actually it's only worth you know another another amount um, and so I'm going to hand over and talk and, 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 and hand over to Shaquille in terms of not just growing but also protecting your business because that has to do with you know practical issues of, of risk assessment RSM, the RSM methodology in this space as well Shaquille um, I've, I've, I've hopefully enabled you to turn your video on if you can unmute. Great. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Um, so to, uh, let's discuss practical issues in uh, risk assessment and RSM methodology. Uh, first of all, let's uh, try and define some of these terms or explain uh, what these terms are because it's very common. A lot of people actually use uh, risk management, risk assessment and risk analysis all interchangeably. So what are all these terms? Uh, risk management is actually the identification, analysis, and the treatment and monitoring of risk. Uh, risk assessment, 
simply includes processes and technologies that actually identify, evaluate, and report on these risk-related concerns. So risk assessment is actually a key uh, process, a key part of risk management. Uh, risk analysis is the actual quantification of risk, um, calculating the probability and magnitude of loss. If we go to the next slide, from this diagram you can see from a hierarchical perspective, risk analysis is actually part of risk assessment, which in turn is part of risk management. So risk assessment and risk management are not one and the same thing. Rather, risk management is an umbrella term where risk assessment is one of the key functions. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so now let's just discuss the actual topic we have in hand, practical issues in risk assessment. In order to answer this question, I'm going to pose another question to say what actually happens when you do not proactively identify and analyze and evaluate risks in your organization? Or asked in another way, what actually happens when you do not perform a proper risk assessment? The answer to this question gives you a flavor of the practical issues when performing a risk assessment. So let's look at some of the possible answers. You could have loss of profits, damaged reputation, customer dissatisfaction, fines, product failure, staff turnover, and missed opportunities. So let's look at just some of these in real life examples and what has actually happened to keep this in perspective. I won't talk on all of this, but let's, I will talk on four of these. So staff turnover. We found a recent survey, uh, you know, of users of Glassdoor found in a survey of what is most important to uh, employees, Compensation was one of the least important factors, but other factors that outrank compensation were culture, values, leadership, and growth opportunities. So now the key to understand this point is, if we don't understand the specific factors and not identifying the risks associated with probably talent retention and properly managing those risks, this could lead to a higher rate of staff turnover, which may hinder the ability to meet our goals, and may create much more expense for recruiting new talent. Let's look at the next slide. Customer dissatisfaction. Now this is quite an interesting example. Customers are what keeps the lights on at any organization. And if there's any dissatisfaction for any reason, they may just pick up and move their business to a competitor. So what actually happened here? An example was Target, which is a, a hypermarket in the US, and they had an infamous credit card breach in 2013, uh, in that 40 million of its customers' details had been compromised. And, you know, they hadn't properly identified, proactively assessed, and managed those risks. Uh, the systems, which led to a lot of complaints, a lot of court cases they had to pay a large penalty Shaquille and a lot of people moved their business organization. Shaquille your, yes, your, um, your your network isn't great maybe if you just turn your video off and we just hear you um that'll be fine that'll just help with the bandwidth um okay no, is that better can you hear me that seems better but that's great we can hear if you just want to go back about 30 seconds 40 seconds on what you were covering Yes, so I was talking about customer dissatisfaction as an example of not proactively identifying and assessing uh, your risks. So what I was saying was customers are what keep the lights on at any organization. And if there is any dissatisfaction for any reason, they may pick up and move their business to a competitor uh, and report all this on social media. This is what happened with a company called Target in the US, which is a large hypermarket. And they had a you know, credit and debit card breach uh, or details of all the customers, about 40 million of them. And they didn't manage this exposure on time or correctly. So what happened was a lot of customers resorted to social media. This caused uh, you know, damaged reputation and uh, a lot of fines had to be paid by the entity. So the point to make is one has to be completely proactive with identifying and assessing and managing your risks. The next slide talks about the missed opportunity. Not identifying threats and opportunities to achieving your business objectives 
may also lead to missed opportunities and a possible loss of market share and eventual irrelevance. And a fantastic example on this is actually BlackBerry, which we know in the 2000s was at the cutting edge of innovative products that integrated email and other features aimed at mainly business users. However, the company missed several, several cues that technology was developing at such an exponential pace that in today's time we have touchstone phones and you have the Android and the Apple systems, which has completely made the BlackBerry completely redundant. So yeah. when you don't move with technology and with the times, that completely uh, diminishes your opportunities. Yeah, I was just thinking that I've been through that exact journey. I've been to Apple, I've been BlackBerry. You know, we always used to call about BlackBerry Messenger. Now, I think when we say BlackBerry Messenger, we give away our age, Shaquille. That's right. <laughs> um, the final example of this is a damaged reputation. And what uh, we're talking about here is the consequence of ignoring risk management, risk assessment is similar to customer satisfaction, a dissatisfaction. However, the impact is much more significant because it usually involves activities within an organization more than just a mere mishap. And examples of this were between 2011 and 2016 about the recent scandals at Wells Fargo, where over 5,000 employees were creating false accounts just in order to meet sales targets. And they were, the entity was slapped with a massive fine. And until now, Wells Fargo is not only dealing with that, it's dealing with employee turnover and a lot of customer dissatisfaction. And this causes damage to core reputation that will take uh, a very, very long time to undo. Our final slide on this is, so what, what happens if we have all this? Well, what do we do? Well, I think the answer is uh, pretty simple. We must all take a proactive approach. And this is where RSM may come in to assist some people. We have uh, a defined uh, you know, team here that actually helps in specializing to uh, assist people in identifying and managing your risks. In the event that this becomes a reality, we can also help you deal with the consequences. And the way we do that is to have specialized teams within co-sourced and outsourced internal audit. Uh, we look at enterprise risk management consulting. We look at your information systems. We look at all your compliance assessments, so AML, which is anti-money laundering, which is very topical in this country. We look at the anti-bribery and corruption rules. We look at the KYC, and we look at cybersecurity services. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. Back um, thank you. Thank you, Shaquille. Um, and I think that list is a, is, is a really challenging one for many of our businesses. I mean, those of us who, who are fitness you know, freaks would know that in the last um, week, a company like Garmin has gone down, mainly because of our watches and things, but actually a company with a data breach or a hacking incident also puts aviation at risk, a whole lot of different things. And I think what Shaquille is, is, is trying to demonstrate, especially in some of the examples, is that risk is interrelated. It's everywhere. Good question from George, who's, um, who's online. And he asked about how do we apply some of these things to the public sector? And although this isn't the focus of this, it's really critical to understand if we think about what Ashif shared about valuation in the public sector, there is obviously slightly different ways about looking at value. It has to do, I suppose, with services, et cetera, et cetera. But from a risk perspective, state-owned public sector entities, um, whatever you call them, are critical in terms of thinking through risk. They have exactly the same factors at play in terms of, in terms of risk. Ashif, do you want to just throw in anything there? Yeah, my sense is, you know, I've, I've actually even served on board of uh, public sector companies. I was a director on telecom. And I think the issues are that while you're not going to sell these companies, the issue of value is, you know, in the minds of the consumers is what is the state organization providing to them. Yeah. But remember, all state organization needs to access capital. And when the people are providing that capital don't see, uh, you know, that value in that organization, don't see the uh, vision, don't see the purpose, don't see the entire financials, the entire uh, value drops. But the second part also is that I was involved, and this is public, uh, where Telcom Kenya, when it was sold, I, you know, uh, there was a 24 billion shillings claim against the government of Kenya, which I was, which is about 240 million dollars, and I was a financial negotiator on that claim. 
Okay. Mm. And the issue is that when the, you know, accounts and the financial statements and everything is not really up to date. Okay. It makes it very difficult to defend the claim. In this case, it was done. Uh, but, but again, it, there is no difference in privatization. The same issues that apply to private companies apply to public companies. And, you know, when you, when you $240 billion, $240 million claim uh, on, your, on your table, it's never going to be easy. And again, the same principles, you know, come in. Yeah, yeah, as well as from a risk point of view. And I think it's really important to look at this. And so it's about growing and protecting value and risk. Um, thank you, Jens, for sharing the, the, the detail and some of, the, some of the things you can do there. It's then also, so when we look at the board, so looking back and saying, how do we then think about linking board performance with company performance? It's really, there's really two aspects to it. It's firstly, I believe, and we believe very strongly, it's about the team in the room. And this is where a lot of companies don't necessarily systematically think about who is actually sitting in the room. And then it's obviously what do these people actually do? What does governance actually mean? And given the time, we obviously don't have a huge amount, so we can't unpack a huge amount, but this is the area that, that we as Siddhar are very involved in. And as we said, one of the key things coming out of the survey was the role of independent directors. And one of the things that was, was an interesting insight for me was that boards without independent directors evaluated themselves poorly compared to boards with at least one independent director. Now, these are objective survey, you know, survey, survey facts that are coming out. And one of the critical things for all boards right now is to self-evaluate. Look at yourselves, look at the people sitting around, um, even in your mind's eye, the people sitting around the table, and are you the right team to be acting in the best interest of the company? And George, that applies to public sector or private sector or micro business, uh, macro business, family businesses. Ultimately, the board is the group of people that together are accountable for what the company's performance is. Um, only 36% of the boards without an independent director, without any independent directors, were satisfied with their impact, the impact of the board on the company performance, compared to 78% over double the number of boards who had independent directors, the satisfaction over double what um, the link between their performance was and company performance. And so just a simple thing of re-looking at building or composing a board is really, really critical. And so some things to take into account in the last few, last few minutes together um, is to really think about, firstly, it's a principle that is, that is critical, is that every seat around the boardroom table is precious. And I put five here, but it could be three, it could be a 10, it could be seven. But every seat is precious. If someone in, sitting in a seat, occupying a seat of director, isn't, um, isn't playing the game properly, playing their position properly, then they are wasted in terms of their effort. I know I've used the strong word there, but often they're, they're ineffective. If we have two people in the boardroom who are identical, also the same set of thing, uh, the, the same challenge, challenge applies. And so if we think about boards, I like to look at it from two perspectives. There's the outside in perspective and the inside out perspective. When we talk about the outside in perspective, it's simply looking at the different types of directors that we understand and know. And we all use these terms and we all understand the difference between the likes of an executive director, EDs, a non-executive director, NEDs, and an independent director, someone who has no other relationship with the company except their board seat. But what has become a big theme coming out of a lot of the recommendations around boards and the recommendations in cor corporate governance codes all over the world are that we need to get the balance right. And what we need to understand is that the system we operate in, certainly in South Africa, certainly in Kenya, and many of the countries we work in, is called a hybrid board system. It's the board is a legal, you know, grouping, it's a grouping of people that consists of people who are both involved in the company and people who are not involved in the company. And to act in the best interest of the company, as we've seen, those, in a sense, I call them inside outsiders. You know, they're in the boardroom, they are legally liable for the company, but they're able to bring that different perspective. That perspective that is better at examining what's going on in the room, that is often less burdened, in inverted commas, by power plays, by other relationships and other other interests in the room. And so most codes say that those people, independent people should be one of the larger blocks on a board than others to balance out the different interests 
in the board. And that's obviously a challenge. Um, even recently, I saw an article about the value of independent directors on family-based boards. And it's a massive challenge. I do agree, and it's a hurdle to overcome, but they can add huge value to the company that ultimately adds value to the shareholders at the end of the day. Then if we think about it from the inside out, um, and we think about it thinking through what each person around the table, so those seats that are precious, we've got to ask ourselves, what do they bring to the table? And if we build it out from the center, at the core, all board members should share the, share the same fundamental set of values. They should believe the same things are valuable, and often that's the best alignment around decision-making. Because remember, this is a team of people who are accountable for all of the decision-making ultimately in the business. They may not make all the decisions, but all of the decision-making accountability ultimately sits on their shoulders as a director. They should also be able to direct. And I think one of the key things here is that when we think about the core skills of directing and what we're, what we're thinking about, it's saying, let's think about these things that are, I put up on the slide earlier. Um, there are certain themes that are critical to address at governance level before management is able to operate at management level. Governors in a business effectively create the space for management to operate within through policies, through procedures, through processes. So all of that fits into the picture. But it's ultimately about the north-south. Are the directors on the same page in terms of what the vision and strategy and destination of the business is? As Ashif said, that's critical in terms of value because that's ultimately what it's all about, why this company exists. But at the same time, being accountable for what we leave behind, the sustainability elements the impact of the business, not just on shareholder returns, which is critical, but also on the greater environment, the stakeholder elements that you see there, the other risk elements that you see there as well, taking into account that between the future and the, and the present or the past, there is this journey that we have to embark on into the future, and that impacts various parties, the stakeholder view, and that means we have certain things to avoid and to deal with as we, as we go. Um, and I think this is where the opportunities come in. George, I see that one question or comment about risk management being an opportunity. And how do we think about that in our strategy and especially in this time? And I'm seeing at this time, boards are really looking strongly at re-looking at their strategy, re-looking at who they impact, their stakeholder mapping, and re-looking at the risk side of things. Obviously, it's then this east-west dimension, in a sense, on the compass here of a company that does well, that is effective, that performs, if we think about it in that way, and a company that conforms, that obeys the rules to the law, but also compliance and conformance to financial um, you know, standards and all of those things that, that Shaquille and Ashif spoke through. Some of those challenges, we don't have that expertise necessarily in our teams, but we have to both perform, have an effective company, as well as conform. And then there's the element of evaluation and improvement and the fundamental culture of the business. Is it one of evaluation and improvement um, on an ongoing basis? And is there a culture of continuous improvement in our businesses? Around those core skills of directing, there would be a set of specialist skills. So based on what the company wants to achieve, its strategy, the sector it's in, obviously, the stage of business. So different companies in their stages of business and business maturity go through various challenges. And though the skill set around the boardroom table should, should be able to take the company through the next season. We often look at the skill set of our directors in terms of what we feel we've been missing in the past. We actually need to ask what skills do we need for the future. And again, that's a critical challenge right now during this crisis. Then there's obviously the perspective or diversity issues. And here, it's really important. And what is coming out of other surveys, we have some things in the SADAR survey about, especially the gender balance of boards, some interesting um, findings there if you want to read the survey and down, as I said, downloadable from our site, but really looking at the benefit of different diversity, a different group of people. The key thing, the key challenge around the board is a board isn't a people and should never be a people who are exactly the same, who all think alike and look alike and you know, respond in the same way. They should be the right mix of people who bring the right perspectives to the team so that the board can do, uh, the company can do well. It's what the company needs, not what the team needs, because the team is there for the company. And so even as an individual director, I need to ask myself, do I have the right values? Do I know how to direct? 
what are my specialist skills that I'm bringing to the table and does the company need them now because that changes over time. And then what perspectives am I bringing that are different from the other people in the room? Now, obviously the dynamic of that around a boardroom table puts some challenges on how we run our meetings, the facilitation of meetings, the challenges around, around that. Um, and that's why one of the other things we think about when we talk about or we try to understand when we try to talk about a balancing the board is we talk through this concept of personal profile. And in addition to all of the other things, and I suppose to complement everything from the values and the core skills and the specialist skills, each one of us also brings our own personality, personal profile to the table. And we use a tool called the contribution compass, which helps us measure a number of different I call them buckets of energy that each one of us carry around with us all the time. And that determines how we respond in situations, how we engage with the world, how our minds think and what we can contribute to the table. And so the four broad types of energy, those people who get things going, who accelerate things, who get things going, initiate change. Those people who are higher in the sustaining energy, who would nourish ideas better not just have the ideas. I'm, I tend to have lots of ideas. I don't necessarily nourish them as well as they could. Those who kindle growth in others who are very good at working together with a team and who think together are very good at getting a team into the same place. Um, those who are very good at the refinement and the analysis and the precision. And we need all of those energies around the boardroom table. The reality is people with those different balances or different mixes of energy tend to look different. And so I'm not going to go into detail here, but the contribution compass, what it does is it says that ultimately everybody with their mix of energies has certain characteristics. And so the tool we use labels people in a sense, it puts people um, in, in, and it says based on your profile, this is what, how you would respond to different situations. And so the idea going back is to say, if we think about our board, we want people that, from all over the compass on our board. We don't want people who cluster in one of the areas to the detriment of, an, of, of another area. And often what will happen in a business, we will tend to draw like-minded, like-thinking people in the growth phase of a business, but the next stage of the business to get through, it's really, really important to think about how do we put other people around the table, people who will bring, as I said, other perspectives, other thinking. And then obviously the challenge of getting all of that together, that team of people onto the same page to act in the best interests of the, of the company. Um, and the role of the chairman becomes absolutely critical in that, in that space. Um, and so in looking at how your board is doing right now, it's important to think about saying, do you need and possibly the, the place to start if you think about action? So I think some great actions have come out of what a chief and Shaquille have covered is there may be an action that says, let's look at this company again. Let's take a step back from the company and understand what it's worth. There's what Shaquille said, maybe we need to look at our company and understand the environment it operates in internally and externally. And what do we need to look at? But a lot of those things come out of, come, are revealed when we do a board evaluation. And a board evaluation is designed to ask the question, how does the individual board member sit in the team of the board? and ultimately serve the organization that they are there to serve as a team. And so it's linking through, it's asking the question in a sense from the board evaluation point of view, what does the organization need? Because based on what the organization needs, your company, and again, I use the word organization because this is, this is generic from the point of view of saying, this could be public sector, private sector, nonprofit, any entity that is being governed has to ask the question, what does it need? Based on that, we've got to ask who is the team? What mix of skills, mix of personalities, mix of input do we need at board level? And how does each board member play on that team? You see, often what happens is when we see companies doing board evaluations, it's a case of saying, it's all about me. And it looks at like criticism. It's not criticism. It's asking the question, am I the right player on the right team for the organization? A different set of skills. It's very different from doing a management evaluation and a performance evaluation in our functional teams. A board evaluation is quite, is quite different. And so boards with independent directors coming out of the SADAR survey again, were more likely to implement a performance evaluation process as strongly encouraged in most African and international governance codes. It's a critical element to, to think about. 
Um, and so going back to you know where, where I started, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to put up a put up a poll um, and ask you the question. You know, I would love to find out more about. So based on what we've what we've just you know covered as I, as I talk through some of the last concepts, I'd like to you to complete the poll I've just dropped up. Um, just to ask you some of the things we've spoken about, what areas you think you'd like to find out more about? Because obviously, one of the things we'd like to do is to say, how do you get hold of us, but also us getting, getting in touch with you. You're welcome to select a number of those things. Hopefully, I've made it so that you can select multiple aspects. And so, also feel free as we go to drop any questions onto the chat box or onto the Q&A box. So, in summary, in a sense, linking boardroom performance and the boardroom performance being the individuals, the individual directors, the people who are in the room, their role of directors as fiduciaries of the company, their position in this mix of companies and the dynamic of relationships that we see in companies, and then their relationships with various people in the room, outside of the room. Are they combined? Are we thinking about how do we put them into the, into the, the, the room together? composing it, constructing it, renewing it. And that's the board evaluation element also looks at ensuring that we have a renewal process. Are we doing the right things? The governance compass that is a methodology to say, let's cover off at least what we need to do in our board calendar and think about it going forward. And ultimately all three of those, the lever and the pivot and the individual is only there to move company performance. And what we're seeing is when we intentionally think about who the board members are, what the board is and what they do, we start seeing the differences in valuation. We start being, seeing the differences in terms of risk management and protecting our businesses going, going forward. I'm going to leave the survey up for a couple more minutes while I just ask um, Ashif and Shaquille if they've got any last words as, as, as we go. And yeah, if there's any other um, comments or questions in the last couple of minutes, um, maybe Ash, uh, Shaquille, anything from your side? Um, uh, thank you, Roger. No, that was very, very informative, and uh, thank you for the attendees. No, no, nothing to add from my side. Okay. Ashif? No, I think uh, you covered all the areas, and really the link between, uh, you know, a, a company, its growth, its value, vis-a-vis -vis what the board does, because that's the focal point, uh, you know, of the company. It's not the shareholders, it's really the board that drives it. And I think sometimes that distinction doesn't come out very clearly uh, because shareholders have got their own drive and board has got their own drive. And I think when we're looking at a company, even if you're shareholder directors, one needs to look at what is the best interest of the company, not is what only the best interest of the shareholders. It is really best interest of stakeholders rather than shareholders. And if you've got the stakeholder interest together and very clearly defined, then the company value will grow and the shareholder value will grow. Mm. Mm. Great point there. I've just shared also the, the, um, the results. I'm going to drop up another poll um, just, just to, I just need to, um, but yeah, just thanks for that. And I think one of the key things to think about um, is really the link between what we're doing in the boardroom and, and, and examine ourselves in terms of what we're doing in the, in, in the boardroom. And I'm just, as put out that other poll, there are a couple of questions have popped up. I just want to quickly read them. Um, Someone says, does the number of independent directors make a difference? So what we've found happening in boards is that it's helpful if, if one restructures a board and thinks about it to bring at least two independent directors on. Really, the, the balance of the board could be what it was because that just helps shift some of the thinking. Um, most codes recommend a majority of independent directors um, and majority of non-executive versus executive. But obviously that's based on the stage of the business. This is a maturing process and that's what we need to recognize about our companies. As Ashif has said, value is something that isn't instantaneous. It's matured over time as well. And the same with our board processes. And so it's finding the balance right. Really, it, it's about making sure there's the right balance in the, balance in the room. So we do find a board, of, a board of five having at least two independent directors is helpful. When it goes to seven to nine, maybe three or four is helpful. And, and the key recommendation in all of the codes is that the chair is one of the independent directors because they effectively need to ensure that, remember, they lead the board. They don't lead the company. That's what the MD does. But in critical in terms of leading the discussions and being able to challenge the thinking in the room in the best interest of the company. Um, absolutely critical. Um, there's a comment here just, 
Uh, George, again, thanks for your comments as, uh, and questions. And I think some of the challenges have been to really think about at the, at the moment. So the crisis is an opportunity to rethink, as that quote said right in the beginning. We, we've hit this T-junction. Um, and part of that rethinking is to say, as Shaquilla said, maybe think through your risk management framework a lot more. Go back, take a step back, relook at it, relook at your strategy and ask the question, do we have the right people around our board or inputting into our process to provide insight and input into the strategy of the business? And then also the key question in the moment is also to think about who we are impacting. And the, you asked the question about leverage. We all have to take risks. Um, and it's in managing the risks appropriately that we unlock opportunities as we, as we go. Um, but you know, Roger, just uh, yeah. you know, taking to the George's question about uh, uh, you know the current crisis, I think it's also important to understand that the companies that survive, okay, are companies that actually have a solid foundation. And you know, if you're looking at doing something, uh, you know, new now, make sure that the solid foundation is there, and you know, the your pylons that are supporting your roof are there. Everything else will come, you know, in between. But it's mm. it's it's critical that you know. Uh, the world is becoming more interlinked. Uh, you know, we are having a webinar today with people uh, from all over East Africa. Webinar being mm. conducted, you know, between Joburg and Nairobi. Okay, and mm. that's that's the changing way of you know how people are thinking. So the issue is how do you get more people? Uh, traditional methods of advertising and others might not work because you now need to reach out to the masses. How do you reach out to them? So the whole process. Is going to change, but even in this crisis, you look at Kodak, and I was, you know, reading today with interest that Kodak have borrowed about seven hundred and fifty million to produce drugs for COVID nineteen. Now Kodak, you know, we all know that it, it it was a failed business. We say that you know they didn't look at the times and they didn't respond, and now they responded in a totally different way. Mm. But also understanding your core competence, like you know, Big, look at Big. Big is an interesting thing because what Big found is that they could connect plastic and metal together. And that was their core competence. And they went and did all these products, lighters, razors, pens. And you know, there's no lighting, lighter company that produces razors. And yep. there's no razor company that produces pens. Yep. Okay? <laughs> and Big does all that together. And again, it's, it's really when you have a board and it challenges your core competence, is when you understand where you are and where you can make that mark. I also mm. know of a hospitality company that realized that, you know, they were really good in what they were doing, but they also realized that hotels now needed very good hospitality and cleanliness. So they pivoted from a hotel business to helping, uh, you know, uh, uh, hospitals be clean and safe. Mm. Okay? And they called that company called Blue Sapphire. But it's an interesting aspect of how somebody can take their business and see how it works in another business. Mm. And that requires you know, somebody to see the woods from the tree. That's yeah, what a yeah, yeah. director brings in, an independent perspective. Yeah, and I think that, that addresses exactly a number of questions. So there's a number of questions popping up just about independent directors. And I think you've raised, the, uh, you know, well, they've raised a couple of things about the difficulty. So we're not saying that bringing independent directors is an easy process. It does take a level of maturity, especially if it's the first the first time one is doing it. I think the, the flip side is, if you're appointed as an independent director, realize the dynamic you're walking into. You know, a family business, if you're the first independent director, it's probably going to be a bit, a bit challenging up, up front, but it takes a maturity of the, of the business and a recognition that it's necessary. And this is, this is a journey that both RSM and Sadar can help companies walk through because we've been there. We've talked through it. We've walked companies through it. And that's really what what, um, what, what I think here. So there's a number of questions about the difficulties. And this is why one of the challenges would be to bring an independent chair into a company because an independent chair can step back from some of those interests and help assist with it. Not only, you know, not always independent, but it's that independence of thinking that becomes absolutely, absolutely critical. James, I see your hand, but I'd like to, if you could just drop your question onto the, the question box, it would make it, make it easier. Um, so how do we make sure independent directors really engage, make sure that you, they're given a space for engagement, you know, taken seriously, they add value 
to the to the process going going forward question about how do you position yourself to be an independent director very very important number one i think it's upskilling yourself going back to the the question and asking well do you understand what the core skills of directing entail part of what we do is as as said as we we train people who want to be better directors in their own companies but also be independent directors as um as well so we can send you that that kind of information but also it's self-examining and asking what what skills you bring to the table um Just on that, that question yeah. you know on, on upskilling yourself you know i've gone through a number of director training program uh one one is from center of corporate governance you know which was the basic legality is a very detail around that which you require but i've also gone through the sardar certification and i think you know this is an independent you know my own i found it very useful because you know it brought in a lot of things that were not only legal but it brought in all the aspects of a business together and even for somebody like me who actually does a lot of this work uh, you know it added a lot of value and i still mm. go back to some of the uh, material that is there uh, you know once in a while to just refresh my memory of what needs to be done but there is yeah. also another question from beju who says that you know if there are two independent directors also another independent director is another company mm. do they bring independence my sense is it's your contract what do you want yeah. from them to yeah. me you know if you want an independent director you need to tell them this is going to be your role that they need to be interested and believe in your company you need to ask them the question why do you want to come and be a director in my company mm. and make sure that you know you you understand and you know if they are independent directors even if they sit on one or two companies it really doesn't make a difference but yes if you see that they've got a vested interest in something then you have a problem so you really need to understand the whole issue of what is their objective in becoming directors and in the context of east africa a lot of people want to become directors just because uh, you get some recognition okay mm -hmm. uh, outside the market there are few who now believe that i want to add value to the company and that is where you need to test the passion out to see if this in the independent director not only brings value but as the passion for your company and will give it the time mm. and the last part is an effective director for every 4 hour board meeting needs to spend 6 to 8 hours reading the material mm. and that is why yeah. compensation of directors becomes very critical so 4 hour board meeting is one and a half days uh, you know of total meeting time and if that person is not reading the board paper you'll easily yeah. pick it up okay mm. but if people yeah. are coming to the glory they will just come for the meeting without reading and they'll just sit there through the whole meeting and i think those are very critical points in assessing effectiveness yeah there's a couple of other good queries thanks for that ashif and i think there's a few things there and thanks for thanks for your feedback on the on the program we 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 run a couple of questions here so there's a couple of technical questions about independent directors so a financier on a board couldn't be a, an independent director because they have another relationship contractually with the company and i think this is the it's it's often the thing that i just go back to how many relationships does the person have with the company if they're a shareholder they're not independent if they have had a recent operational position in the company they are not independent um technically and if they have another contract financing um vc venture capital private equity those kind of things wouldn't typically be independent directors it that doesn't mean that those shareholders by appointing an independent director that director is it independent uh, again there's quite a lot of detail in some of in some of these as as well um so so question about how do you start thinking about rotating directors and i know that we've you know we've we've obviously um over time but if you need to if you need to leave that's that's fine we'll take a couple more minutes because there's a good set of questions but one of the best ways to start thinking about rotating a board is to have a board evaluation because what that does is it raises the issues of whether the people sitting around the table are still adding value and will add value to the business into the next into the into the future because often what happens is we sit with the same group of people and just because remember the challenge is just because we've been successful and then we need to rotate to director isn't a criticism it's not a, whereas often we take it as a personal judgment on us it's not it's saying we've played our role to bring the company to where it is and it needs someone else it needs another set of skills that we can move on and do something something different with and i think that's one of the challenges and so a board evaluation process would obviously be designed to take some of those some of those things into into account um but yeah we again going back to saying changing governance is essential to make sure that we link 
board performance, we have company performance, but it, it involves a number of different dynamics as, um, as well. Um, one of the questions that came up is, are we um, going to share the slides after, afterwards? And here are just some, some contact details in our last couple of minutes together. Um, we will be sharing the slides, but there's a little bit of a caveat. So what we're going to do is there will be a survey that pops up after the webinar. We're also going to be sending you some, some feedback. We'd love to know. That's why I put some of the polls up to see how better we can serve, serve you. If you complete the survey, get it back to us. We'll send you a PDF of the of the presentation um, as well. So there's a bit of a trade-off there. So please, when you get, you'll get an email after the after um, after the webinar. Um, please respond to that with the information, and we'll we'll send you a um, to those who completed. We'll send a copy of the presentation. Thanks again. There's a few other questions that are coming up here, but I think we've we've really spoken about um, you know going you know, asking the question, how does a board linked to company performance, boardroom performance, and boardroom performance consisting of, in a sense, who's around the table and what do those people talk about. Um, and so we've, we've very strongly addressed the area of who's around the table quite a bit, recognizing the role of independent directors based on survey information that literally is very, very recent. Um, and we're seeing that more and more and more. And that it, 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 it um, confirms what other surveys have also said, but we're the first people to actually do it as Africa-wide as, as, as possible. Um, and then, obviously, what does the board do? The structure of board discussions in our board process, addressing everything from strategy to sustainability to performance to conformance. And the two key elements that um, my fellow pal panelists um, covered, we're really looking at what do we need to look at and linked to that valuation, value of the business, having a clear strategy, but also making sure the engine built to deliver that strategy is robust and well managed and well accountable. And then the risk elements, recognizing from international examples that, that risk is a, is, a, is a complex thing and we have to properly step back from our businesses, understand the intertwinedness in a sense of different risks that we, that we face. Um, and so thanks again for taking the time, um, for spending the time, um, for investing the time hopefully um, this morning and we trust that you do have you have our, our contact details will be in touch with you um, following this following this webinar um, thank you very much for your time I trust it's been valuable all the very best and thanks very much to Ashif and Shaquille um, for the time as well Ciao. thank you Roger thank you, thank you. signing off thanks Thank you, everyone.